Hi, everybody. It's, it's too dark. <laughs> okay. The video will look fantastic. So, give down the likes. Uh, I'm Ruth. Thank you so much for coming to the Conservation Lecture Series tonight. Uh, my name is Ruth Muck. I'm our Director of Conservation and Research here at Sequoia Park Zoo. And we are very excited to welcome this giant crowd tonight for our 12th annual lecture series. <laughs> and we want to thank our sponsors tonight, who are Pasa and Barkley. They've been sponsoring the lecture series for a long time. And it has been so much fun to have such a diversity of speakers over the years coming to talk to our community. So thank you to them. I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping things while we're in here. 
If anyone needs to use the restroom, you'll go out the doors in the back here, and it's just to your right. And if you need to leave early, you can exit out the back. And the gate that you came in through gate C here, you'll be able to exit through that gate. And we've got a big crowd tonight. So if we can remember to please silence and do not disturb our phones so they're not ringing during the lecture, that would be fantastic. Um, so our lecture series is put on by our conservation advisory committee. And if you haven't heard of our committee, um, our goal is to support the zoo's conservation vision by raising public awareness about relevant conservation topics like uh, just like the Condor program and the Condor reintroduction that's going on. And we also select important conservation field projects to support through our zoo's conservation fund. This lecture series is one of the programs and January's upcoming conservation grants are another one of our trips. If you are doing conservation and research, um, we are welcoming people to apply for those grants. They're through January 27th. And I want to give a big thanks to Michaela Gunther, who has organized this series every single year. We so appreciate that. And the rest of our committee, who we have David here, Jim is here. Um, we have a, a wonderful group of people that help facilitate all this conservation and work going on at the zoo. Um, for our virtual participants, hello, thank you for coming. Um, we're going to have a QA at the end, and you can ask questions in the Zoom chat and through the Facebook Live comments. So please submit those as you come up with them, and we will. We have a huge crowd here tonight, too. We'll try to get to all the questions if we can. Um, and we have the participants' audio and visual settings turned off on purpose. That's to help enhance the streaming experience. And there are different captionings available, too, if you're watching on Zoom. Please take advantage of those. So I am going to introduce David Reed, who is our executive director of the Sequoia Project Zoom Foundation who will be sharing about our program and introduce our speaker. Thanks, Ruth. Um, hi, I am so honored to introduce Chris West. I first got to meet him uh, when I worked with another nonprofit locally that was also supporting uh, the reintroduction of condors for the state and national parks. But tonight I'm doubly lucky because I now lead an organization that is supporting uh, the work that Chris and Tiana williams Blossom, the director of uh, the Iraq Wildlife Department, and all those wonderful people in the back corner back there, and the entire Iraq tribe are doing to bring Prego Niche, uh, the California condor, back above our redwood skies. Uh, as Ruth said, I'm David Reed. I'm the executive director of the Sequoia Park Zoo Foundation, and to put it simply, we're the nonprofit that supports the zoo any way we can, a, a number of ways. Uh, and the zoo and the foundation have actually been committed to supporting the reintroduction of California condors since 2016. Uh, and the zoo's supporting role in this story is as a place to provide medical care for injured condors, especially condors um, that have, are lead poisoned. And that is through um, the newly finished Condor Care Center. Uh, in 2017, the foundation uh, first did their first fundraiser for California condors, and we raised $35,000 from about 50 people in one night. That was part of our annual Zucchini event, and the community surrounding the zoo came forward again in 2019, and then again finally last year. Uh, to raise the last of the funding that we needed to complete the community care center. So for those of you who are donors to the Zoo and the Zoo Foundation, thank you so much. Um, all told, individual donors have given more than $80,000 for the Condor Care Center, and that is about 70% of the total construction cost, which is very unusual. Usually, capital projects mostly come from foundations. This came from people like you in almost entirely. And this December, more donors came forward to support ongoing medical care for California condors once the California Condor Care Center is up and running and has birds in it, which is just phenomenal. 
Um, and the California Con Condor, ugh, California Condor Care Center, that's a lot of CDs. Um, it's an interesting part of the zoo's conservation mission because um, first of all, it's out of sight and you will probably never see the building if all goes well. Um, you might see a video. Um, and uh, Director Jim Campbell Spickler likes to say, um, it's the facility that you hope you never have to use because you don't want to have a sick bird, you know, especially an endangered bird uh, at your zoo or in your, in your medical facility. But it is a crucial part of ensuring that these endangered animals are successful in the wild. So it has to be here and we're glad that it is. So thank you to everyone who supported this effort from 2016 to today. And thank you for your continuing support. Um, about Chris. Chris West. <laughs> this is what happened. By the way, there are 62 of you in this room. There's 160 of you uh, listening online. <laughs> it is the most successful, at least I'm told from the Eye in the Sky, the most successful uh, conservation lecture ever. Chris West began working with California Condors as an intern with the Ventana Wildlife Society in 1999, leading to his master's research at Humboldt State University, then Humboldt State University, investigating condor vigilance behavior, which I hope I will understand what that means by the end of the night, uh, vigilance behavior while feeding. He began working with the Yurok tribe in 2008, working to establish the first California condor reintroduction site in the Pacific Northwest, and is now the manager of the Northern California Condor Restoration Program. Chris earned his bachelor's degree in biology from the University of California at Santa Cruz and completed his master's degree at Humboldt State University, now Cal Poly Humboldt, in wildlife management. And I am so happy to introduce Chris West. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Over the piece, other people. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate everyone's interest in our project and in the condors. Um, I'm going to jump into things pretty quickly. I'm told that you should do about one slide a minute. And I was targeting about 45 minutes and 45 slides, but I have over 70. So um, <laughs> I'm going to be moving, moving rapid fire. So I'm going to start out with just talking a little bit about uh, where is best to hold this thing because it's, it's not an exact quick thing. So I have to click the screen. Hey guys, I will look at my hands now. Okay, so um, I will uh, start out talking a little bit about condor uh, biology. Um, really, condors are just really big vultures. They have about a nine and a half foot wingspan. They weigh between 17 and 25 pounds. So that's kind of what makes them special. Of course, they're also very rare. And so uh, that also makes them popular with, uh, with bird fans out there. We don't really know about their lifespan. Uh, closely related Andean condors have lived 80 years in captivity, so they have a pretty long life. Okay, there we go. Um, condors exhibit lifelong monogamy. So once a pair uh, gets together and breeds and is successful at fledging a chick that solidifies their pair bond and they'll stay together, they only lay one egg every other year and they have a pretty long incubation period of about 60 days. And uh, young don't fledge until about half a year of age. They then don't reach sexual maturity until six to eight years of age. And it's this slow reproductive strategy that condors employ that kind of actually gets them into trouble. If you think about if, if a pair of condors is doing their, their best job, their maximum fledge rate is about one bird every other year, in 10 years, they could have five offspring. Um, if you think about eagles or turkey vultures, they can have up to three young in a year. Then you look at that same 10 year period and they could have 30 offspring. So that big difference there really comes into play when a condor, or when you're thinking about uh, mortality. And if you get a slight increase in mortality in condors, 
that can lead to a population level effect very quickly. So that's why you see big problems with condors that you don't necessarily see with other species, even with the same mortality factors at play. Condors are obligate scavengers. That means they feed only on dead sap. Condors are not going to swoop down and take your puppy from the, the dog yard or anything like that. So you can be, uh, feel confident about that. Going. Okay, so at one point in time, condors range all the way across what is modern North America, all the way up through uh, the East Coast and down to Florida, and bred all the way across. And, okay. uh, and by about the time of Euro American settlement uh, in North America, they had really constricted their range to this kind of uh, brownish area on the western seaboard. By the 1950s, they had constricted even further to this kind of horseshoe-shaped area in central and southern California. And you can see the decline here. Uh, the 50s is what I just showed, that horseshoe-shaped area. This is uh, about 1953. There was about 60 birds. The declines continued until the low of only 22 individuals left in the world in the early 1980s. At that point in time, wildlife agencies decided it was best to take the remaining birds into captivity to prevent the species from going extinct. Um, there was also obviously a push to try and do some captive breeding and buoy up the population. Luckily, condors bred really well in captivity, and pretty soon they had lots of eggs being produced. They figured out a way to, to change the collecting from one egg every other year to two eggs per year, and the population really started to grow in captivity. And in only 10 years from taking the last birds into captivity for breeding, they started reintroducing birds back into the wild. And this is the, the Ventana Wildlife Society release site in Big Sur in 2000. And here you can see the release sites, um, red stars, uh, and then in yellow, the ranges of the populations coming from those sites. And then the range not established Cache area here for ours, and we'll talk a little bit more about the range of what we've got going on up here in a little while. Also, we now have this going on in the wild. We have parents breeding, offspring being, being produced, so it's not just birds uh, being reintroduced, but it's birds that are breeding in the wild and seeing them contribute to the population. And as of December 2021, the data hasn't been, been compiled for 2022 yet, but we had 537 condors with 334 birds in the wild. So this sounds great, right? We're done. Condors are concerned. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And there's a lot of articles on this graph, but I'll, I'll kind of walk you through it. Um, and what you really got to look at here is uh, the, the red is wild fledged birds. The blue is deaths. And if you think about uh, if you have it about equal, then you got a pretty stable population, right? It's not going up, it's not going down. Well, if you have more deaths than fledgings, then you've got a declining population. And you'll see that in every year for the last decade, we've had far more death than we've had fledgings. And so that is really describing a population that is spiraling the drain still. Um, you can see the releases in green, and if it wasn't for those releases, Condors will be heading towards extinction very, very quickly still. So why is this happening? On this pie chart here, you see uh, the causes of death for birds where we know what actually caused their death. Sometimes they just disappear. Sometimes you find a desiccated carcass and you can't really figure out what happened. But you can see the big sector here is lead with 51% of the known deaths being caused by lead toxicosis. So if we get a handle on that, that makes a big dent in what's going on with the population. So let's look a little bit more closely at the lead issue. Um, lead is a malleable and toxic metal. It's also very dense. It works really well as a projectile. So it is used in ammunition. This is what happens to the neck of a deer after it's been shot with a hunting round. Um, it likely caused a very rapid kill, which is what hunters are going for, rapid humane kills, but it also fragments. 
That's also another good property of lead for hunting. That it, it actually it, it travels at high velocity, and that energy, the kinetic energy being carried by that bullet, turns into a, a shock wave that travels through the animal as the bullet mushrooms and fragments and breaks apart. It's transmitting all of that energy into the animal for that quick humane kill. But with that fragmentation, you can see all of these white pieces here are pieces of lead. This, this image here has over 450 lead bullet fragments just showing in the image. Now, I'm not quite sure how to make this operate. So if you think about how condors forage, they're very social, and this is how they feed. And that bird just pulled a chunk of organ out of that animal, and now they're all fighting over it. That's a very common scene in condor feeding. And now if you imagine that cloud of lead fragments being scattered through that organ, which if you, if you know much about hunting, you know that when a hunter takes an animal, it, they usually gut the animal and leave the gut pile in the field because they don't want to have to carry that out. If that gut pile is riddled with pieces of lead like that, if it was in that organ, there's seven different birds that get pieces of that organ in this video. One of those little pieces of frag, uh, one of those little fragments of lead is enough to kill a condor. So you could potentially have seven dead condors from one organ. So that's kind of what we're up against. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, stop hunting with lead. And there's alternatives out there like this copper rack. And so we can also do other things. We can provide clean food, which we do for the birds. We treat birds with lead toxicosis if we happen to catch them early enough to be able to do something about it. But most importantly, we engage with the hunting community to help them become part of the solution. Most hunters are conservationists at heart. They love the backcountry and the wildlife that they see out there while they go hunting. That's one of the reasons they do it. So once we get this information across to them and empower them with the knowledge, most of them will switch to non-lead ammunition. We just have to keep engaging. Using lead ammunition for hunting is illegal in California, but it's not illegal in other states. And so we just need to keep engaging with the hunting community. Again, empowering hunters with knowledge. But with the problems that we're facing with condors and with the declines, um, is it possible in a human augmented landscape where anthropogenic threats are the primary cause of the decline of condors in the first place? Well, we think it is possible. And this is uh, one of our local artists, Gary Bloomfield's vision of what condor recovery could look like in the Pacific Northwest. We have huge landscapes up here with far fewer people than, than are present in a lot of other places where condors are. So we think that there's a really good opportunity up here, and this is a great place to, to take a, a stand on it. The Yurok tribe decided to get involved with condors. Uh, they started talking about it in the 90s. Condors are significant to the tribe. And uh, in the 2000s, a group of elders got together and they wanted to start a wildlife program for the tribe. And they said, well, what is the most important species for us to try and conserve? And uh, they decided that condor was it. And so they wanted to start a wildlife program with a flagship species to run that program, start the program, and that would be condor. The reason they're so important is that in, in the tribal belief system, condor was one of the first animals to be created by the creator to help kind of put the world in balance and help set up how the world was supposed to be organized with all the rest of the animals and eventually to be uh, cared for by people. Because of that, condor is integral to the jump dance and the white deerskin dance, which are two of the, the most important world renewal ceremonies. And Condor gave his song to the dances and his feathers to be used in the regalia to provide his spirit to the dance. And he is also believed to be the one that carries the people's prayers to the heavens when the people are looking for the world to be put back in balance. Um, so obviously, really important to bring the carrier of the prayers back to the area it hasn't been here for over a century. So um, that, was, that was what they decided they wanted to do. And they really believe that condor restoration is cultural restoration at its heart. Um, and it's the restoration of the Yurok people. And this isn't just of the Yurok tribe. A lot of the local tribes have these same beliefs about condors. And it's also bringing back condor as an expression of tribal sovereign, sovereignty. And it's expanding Yurok management capacity, which is really important in this modern era as well. It's also working in growing partnerships with a lot of uh, federal agencies and other entities 
to kind of align the goals of the tribe with those of other of other agencies and other governing um, entities within the area and kind of striving to achieve cooperation and commitment to species management and recovery. Another picture of Gary Bloomfield looking at what condor restoration might look like up in the Klamath area. Uh, keeping in mind that, that from the tribal perspective, you don't just manage uh, an individual species, you think about holistic, holistic ecosystem management and recovery. And that's really what kind of this is trying to uh, encapsulate here. All the different species integral to the whole ecosystem and uh, kind of looking at it from that perspective. Very early on, the tribe partnered with Redwood National Park in their goals with, of, of reintroducing and recovering condors. And I'm going to give you a brief overview. So there's lots of words in these slides, but we'll get behind pretty quickly. Uh, in 2008, we received our first grant to, to investigate reintroducing condors to the region. In 2009, Redwood National and State Parks joined with us to start doing our work to examine contaminants in the area and do habitat assessments. In 2014, the tribe and Redwood National and State Parks developed a memorandum of, a memorandum of understanding, um, basically saying that bringing condors back to the region was a good idea and it was something that should be done. And this was signed on to by 16 different agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, uh, non-government organizations, and major resource and energy corporations, which was kind of amazing to us but there was a lot of groups that we didn't think would necessarily be be interested that were interested in joining with us on that. so that was that was a major hurdle that we overcame at that point in 2015 um the redwood national and state parks started coming to condor conservation meetings with the tribe in 2016 we initiated the regulatory processes together to actually get this off the ground bringing u.s fish and wildlife service to the table officially in 2021, so five years later, we actually finished those, those assessments and uh, that process. So it was a long, uh, challenging process, but we got through it, which was great. And we reached a finding of no significant impact. Uh, that meant that we could actually break ground and start doing stuff on federal lands to start bringing the condor back. So in a single year, we broke ground, built a state-of-the-art facility and received birds. That was a huge deal. And some of the people in the room uh, here worked with me through that process, and I'm surprised that we all survived it. <laughs> uh, to go back to the regulatory process a little bit, one thing that a lot of people get confused about and, and, and are puzzled over is what it means to have an experimental non-essential designation, which is what the US Fish and Wildlife Service are calling this population. And essentially, it means that we're allowed to customize Endangered Species Act rules. They're not covered with the full Endangered Species Act. We kind of pull back a little bit and then look at what's really important for conserving the species. What can we relax and not worry about that's not going to affect this species in particular? And it allows us to work a little more fluidly with partners like energy corporations and timber companies and things like that who have a lot of concerns uh, about bringing new endangered species back onto the landscape. Uh, and so basically, unintentional take of condors is okay, as long as it's done during otherwise lawful activities. And there's certain protections that are in place that are very rigid, such as protecting nests and uh, from, from certain activities. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the facilities we produce. This is our Condor Management Operations Center. This is in Oregon, California. And uh, this is a building that's on parks land that we were able to renovate with a grant, and it provides us office space, storage space. Our walk-in freezer is here, and uh, we do kind of our, a lot of a lot of our day-to-day -day operations there. Uh, mentioned earlier is the Condor Care Center, um, or you could say the California Condor Care Center if you wanted to get to the 4C designation, mm -hmm. um, and that's right here at the zoo. And what you don't get to see behind the scenes is this is what it looks like. And this is kind of modeled off of the quarantine facilities that are present at the uh, Los Angeles Zoo and the Oakland Zoo, where a lot of condors are cared for. They get lead toxicosis. It's a state-of-the-art center. Um, it's got areas for processing birds. You can feed them through there. There's built-in heaters. Uh, it, it's really designed to care for birds that are that are very compromised. They can't thermoregulate. They have a lot of these issues because 
They have lead toxicosis. Of course, we could bring birds here with other injuries or illnesses, and they can get veterinary care and everything that they need. They need. Our release and management facility uh, was the, the probably the biggest um, task for us to complete in that one year period. And we got funding from, from PG&E and from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this is kind of an overview of it. It's got a flight pin area. It's got this area for biologists to hang out in. We can watch birds through one-way glass. And then we have the double door trap, which is really the heart of the structure. And what the trap allows us to do is we can put food in here and we can have a bird come in from the wild and feed on it, and we can close this door remotely from inside here. The birds don't even see us. Then we can open this door and let them into the pen. Uh, vice versa, we can trap a bird from the pen into here, close this door, and then let it out this way. So if you have a bunch of birds in here and you just want to target one, you wait until that bird comes in here and is feeding, close the door, open that one, and out it goes. So a uh, really critical uh, tool for us to use in the field. And I wanted to show a little bit about what it was like trying to, to work on this pen through um, where we had limited time. We were like, we can't stop. There's no, there's no bad weather days. Um, we were really lucky to have these guys working with us. And this is the Yurok Tribe um, watershed crew, watershed management crew. And um, they are just incredible. They come to work every day with a smile on their face, regardless of what the weather is like. And they're just like, all right, what do we do today? So um, they were they were phenomenal. And again, showing you some of the conditions that they didn't just didn't phase them just up. Oh, it's snowing. Let's do some welding today. <laughs> just fabulous crew. It was a little it was a little rough getting there in the mornings and having to shovel out the equipment so you could start working. But um, but we got through it. And at the end of it all, we had this facility. And you can see uh, Tiana Williams Clausen is uh, the wildlife department director for the Iraq tribe. And we've got Kyle Max and Heather Brown from Redwood National and State Parks, Redwood National Park, and uh, Evelyn Wilhelm. Wilhelm is one of our um, permanent technicians on the crew. So they're all hanging out waiting for the first bird to arrive uh, the day that the first bird arrived. So that was a big deal. Um, as far as preparing birds for release, we're really targeting about six birds a year. Although in the first year, we weren't quite ready and we had birds being held for us and we got them in the spring and released in the spring and then got our regular cohort of birds in the summer and released in the fall. So we actually did two releases in the first year. But from this point forward, it should be about one cohort a year. Um, six individuals per release, per release. We've gotten four in our first two, but somewhere between four and six. Birds are socialized at the breeding facilities uh, for one to three years. So. Um, they learn kind of how to be condors and learn social interactive skills and things like that. Then they'll stay in the, the release management facility for at least four weeks to acclimatize and for us to assess them and see how well they're doing and who's ready to go out. Uh, and we may bring in mentors from zoos. And we'll talk more about mentors, but I'll give you a little bit about them right here. And essentially, they're adult birds that can be brought in and they teach young birds how to be condors. They teach them how dominance hierarchies work. Um, they allow a, a focal point for the young birds to see an adult. Oh, that's an adult behavior. That's what that adult is doing. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and so they learn a lot from these mentors. And then post-release, they act as what we call social magnets. So birds go out. They still want to come back and see what that adult bird is doing. So they come back and they, they'll hang out around the pen. It allows for good flock cohesion to form and uh, also aids us in managing them because they're always coming to where we are. So that's handy as well. We also have to monitor birds once they go out. So um, they have alphanumeric wing tags, so you can read who they are. We also have here, you can see this is a GPS satellite transmitter. So we can actually see exactly where the birds are. We can map them through GPS, and we can then do analyses of how they're using the habitat, what their home range is, what kind of resources they're using. And then we also have radio transmitters, so we can actually hone right in on them with a receiver and go and find them on the landscape. 
We strive to do soft releases, which means birds are ready to go out when the birds are ready to go out. We don't say this bird's going you know, next week or this bird's going on this date. We assess the birds, we watch them. How well are they socializing? Is it hiding in the corner and hiding from the other birds? That bird's not ready to go out. Is it, is it rambunctious and it's, it's you know, interacting with all the other birds and interacting with the adult that's in the pen? That bird's probably ready to go out. So we'll, we'll decide what the, the cohort makeup will be based on how ready the birds seem to be. And we try and let out two birds at a time. So if there's a bird out there trying to learn how to fly and all the rest of the birds out there know how to fly and they're leaving it in the dust, there's someone out there you know, for that bird to hang out with that's also trying to learn how to fly. So they can kind of pair up and those are very social. Uh, when we do trap ups uh, at least twice a year, biannually, spring and fall, they allow for us to get hands on the birds, look at them, do a physical check, see how they're doing. Um, it allows us to, to do tag chains and, and maintenance on transmitters. And we can do blood draws so we can check if they've gotten into lead issues or if there's other um, kind of health issues that could be going on that could be detected from, detected from lead. This is the first bird that showed up to the pen. This is a uh, Toquin 746. What a lot of people on our live feed page, if I don't know how many here have watched our live feed page, but uh, it's very popular. And he just started being called mentor on there. And uh, he was, uh, he, he captured the hearts of many people viewing that page. Um, and he was a fantastic mentor, not too heavy handed, but he, he did, he did lay down the wall when he needed to with the young birds. So he was a really good balanced mentor for, for the flock. And this was the day we received our first cohort of four birds. Um, and you can see how many people, and this isn't everyone that was there, but you can see how many people are involved in something like this. Uh, we've got veterinarians, we've got people from zoos, we've got people from condor breeding facilities. Um, as I said, we weren't ready for those first four birds when they were ready to be moved from the zoo. So they went to the San Simeon release site, Ventana Wildlife Society's site in San Simeon. They held them for, I think five months or six months until we got our site finished and ready to go. And Joe Burnett is the manager for Ventana Wildlife Society. And so he and his crew brought those birds up to us when we were ready to receive them. Uh, we've got folks from the Oakland Zoo here, uh, Dr. Alex Herman, Ryan, Dr. Ryan Sadler, and vet technician extraordinaire, Monica Fox, um, all just, they're like, oh, you're getting birds? We'll just drive up from Oakland and stay for a couple of days and help you. So. Um, Drop of the hat, uh, they come up and help all the time. Fantastic people. We were also honored to have some of the elders that were the people that actually decided that condors should be coming back to the area. So that was a huge deal for us to have them there and able to observe what we were doing, um, along with uh, council member Sherry Krogold, who has been a huge supporter since she came onto the Yurok Tribal Council and is always going to bat for condors wherever she can. And this is what they look like when they got into the pen. Uh, they're just exploring right now. They didn't really know too much about what was going on with the pen, uh, but they had been, they'd spent all that time at the Ventana site together. So they already had good social cohesion as a group. And then mentor up here, the adult, totally ignoring the peons down below. Uh, that's what he should be doing. That's, and, and they're getting that. They're, they're looking over and getting, wow, there's an adult and he's totally ignoring us. He is really cool. <laughs> There's a lot going on here with no condor behavior. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, hold on. Hold on. We just went ahead like lots of slides. <laughs> um, going back. Yeah, we went really far. Um, Point whistle. Point whistle. So there's actually sound here, but I don't know if we're going to be able to hear it. But um, Tiana Williams Clausen actually did voiceovers for a presentation so that she could pronounce the names. I don't know if we'll be able to hear them, but kind of just introducing all the birds. Um, Nesquichak. Nesquichak. So I don't know if you guys can hear it. Is there anything to or is that anything? Can you guys hear? Yeah. And then now those first two birds, those were the first two released, um, A3 and A2. 
And so we've got a little video here of the release. So you guys can see what it looked like. The turkey bulls are like, what So um, you can see if they just take off like that, um, they're now flying. They don't really know how to fly. They've got an idea, but once they get out there, they're like, wow, I'm really high in the air. What just happened? Because uh, they've never been up in the air before. Uh, so that's a, a big challenge. Flowerlet. Flowerlet. That's a... Uh, a1. And now I'm going to show you a, a slightly different release. This is this is A1's release. And you'll see here the difference is the first one we were hoping, oh, the turkey vultures on the ground. Maybe the birds will just walk out and engage with the turkey vultures. Didn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in this release, we managed to carefully close the doors and open the other door so that the birds we had the two condors that had already been released on the ground. So when the bird came out. It was all excited, but oh wait, my friends are just hanging out right there. So it kind of calmed everything down a little bit. So A1 comes out and A2 standing there and A1's like, oh, all right, this is what's happening now. Oh, I'm sorry, A0 was already out as well. You really liked the scale. <laughs> like a little trampoline. We have to replace the scales all the time. <laughs> And of course, he can't have all that fun by himself. So he's just got to go and knock him off. Um, Negem netween kah. Negem netween kah. And that's A0, the last of that. So we're always striving for um, having the birds walk out and be calm like that. And one of the reasons is if they just take off and they don't know how to fly, they just go until they either try and land in a tree or end up somewhere um, and, and maybe on the ground. Sometimes they end up in the prairie. Um, mostly they end up getting back up into the trees, which is great, but we don't know if they're gonna end up on the ground. We don't know if they're gonna be able to get into a good roosting location. And because we don't know if that's gonna happen, we kind of try and follow them and make sure they are somewhere safe. And if they're not, then uh, if a bird beds down on the ground and a predator could get them at night, we tend to try and get somewhere close to them and spend the night with them. Uh, so we'll send out somebody with a can of bear spray and protect that bird tonight. Uh, we haven't had to do that yet, thank goodness. It's been done many times at other sites. Um, but you can actually see, this is kind of her scale. You can see Maddie down here and she's heading off to wherever she ends up. She's got tracking gear and she's gonna follow the signal to the bird that she's looking for until she finds it. And that could be three miles away and it could be hours of hiking. And then if it's if it's a freshly released bird and it's in a tree, she's like, great, it's in a good location. Now I'll just sit here until I'm sure that it's roosting for the night and it's safe. And then I'll hike back out in the dark with my headlamp. So um, our crew is amazing. They do, um, they do hard work like this every day and uh, we're super grateful to have them. 
Um, we're also super grateful for these two ladies back here. This is Jerry Oliphant, Dr. Jerry Oliphant, and Dr. Charlene Lay Schaus. Some of you may have even had uh, dogs or cats treated by them at some point in the past. They had a vet clinic in Arcata. They are now retired, which is great for us because they're basically just always available to us. So we're like, oh, we're going to go up and do stuff with birds. And they're like, okay, we'll come up. And so um, really great. An amazing amount. Should be okay. I'll go to the next slide and see what happens. Oh, I'm still there. <laughs> And so this is Dr. Lei Schaus uh, working up this condor here that we're receiving. Um, again, with Dr. Alex Herman and Monica Fox from the Oakland Zoo. Um, also, we've got uh, Gavin Emmons from Pinnacles National Park at this, uh, at this workup. This is Patrick Myers, our lead field biologist on the project. And Ashley Bouchardini is our most recent addition as a permanent biologist uh, or as a permanent technician overseeing field crews in the field. This is the second cohort of birds, A4, A5, A6, and A7. Chirpach Sanin Nepek. Chirpach Sanin Nepek. You might see why I'm not trying to pronounce these in language. Neen. Neen. Maneo quick. Maneo quick. Hey, wet check. Hey, wet check. So those are the, the newest cohort. So where are the birds going? Well, um, this is kind of a, a graphic which shows kind of the area that they've covered so far. It's a big area, pretty much extending from Oryx all the way down to Willow Creek. So, um, a large area and that's also why we don't have a whole lot of pictures of them in the field to show you guys because there's not many roads out here so we don't even see the birds very often we see them when they come back to the site or if we really have concerns about a bird uh we can go and, and try and find it but it's very difficult this is this is very remote area that the birds are hanging out which is great um mostly they spent their time close to the release area because there's safe food, water, and social opportunities. The longest straight line distance is over, just over 32 miles from the release area. And a couple of birds have been out for, uh, for over three weeks without coming back for food. So that's a pretty long time, but condors have, they have a pretty slow metabolism. So they can, they can handle that pretty well. A3 came back from a three week trip. He weighed about 25 or 26 pounds when he left and he came back still weighing 22 pounds. So um, probably not close to starving, but, but he was probably pretty hungry. How are we doing on time? Okay. So um, now just to kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of some of the exciting things that happen in Condor World, I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of the different things that, uh, that have occurred. One is the A7 saga, and this was followed pretty closely on social media and whatnot. For those of you that didn't follow that, um, one of our technicians, uh, Evelyn Wilhelm, noticed that A7 looked like she had a swollen face when she was still in the flight pen prior to being released. So we decided to trap her up and take a look. And oops, that's not the pointer. You can see here quite a bit of swelling, a little bit of abrasion here. So uh, we got her in hand, we took a look at it, uh, and we ended up actually doing a, a biopsy to be able to do cell culture to find out what was going on inside there. And unfortunately, the cell culture was not really conclusive. And so uh, Jim Cam Campbell Spickler, our very own Jim Campbell Spickler, helped, uh, took, took possession of the bird, Sequoia Park Zoo took possession of the bird, and he uh, took the bird down to Oakland Zoo so that the bird could get a, a more thorough examination. So I'm just gonna show you some videos of some of the occurrences there. So they took the bird in, checked it out at the zoo. This also shows you a little bit about the level of care that these birds get within the program. Um, there's not a lot of them. They're genetically valuable. They're also monetarily valuable. 
put a lot of care into them. And unfortunately, again, it was inconclusive just from that cursory examination. They then took the bird down to Sage Animal Hospital in San Francisco. Separately, right, he was, so. they go hard. They actually put these scans so scans couldn't speak because there was no condor scans on the file. And then they immediately performed surgery and removed the mass. I'm confident she should make a full recovery from this. It seems like an injury to a healthy young bird. So yeah, pretty pretty high tech. And then just to wrap that little saga up, she got to come home, which was fabulous. And the second little bit of, of, of saga that I was going to introduce you all is um, our mentor 746 is not with us now. We're hoping to get him back. But um, some of you may have heard about the avian flu that's going on right now. There's a shortage of eggs and all those sorts of things. Um, and so this H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza has swept across the country. Um, as far as we know, no condors have, have contracted it yet. But um, just close to our facility, we did find a dead turkey vulture. We had it tested. It had avian influenza. So we know it is right in our neighborhood. Um, we're not going to take the birds that are, that are out flying around in to protect them from diseases like this. But um, this bird, 746, is genetically valuable. That's why he's not been released. He is eventually going to go into the breeding program. Um, and since he's a captive bird, but he was in our pen, which is open walled, as you saw, he is exposed to everything in the outside environment while he's there. So um, to do our part to make sure he's as protected as possible, we felt it best to remove him from our facility. He's now down at the Oakland Zoo where he can be protected from the disease. And hopefully if the levels of the disease get low enough in the region, we'll be bringing him back to, to mentor our next round of, of birds that we get. So what's our long-term vision here? Well, it's, we're, we're hoping, like I said, that with lower human population and lower human footprint on the landscape up here, that we're gonna see this area as being really good for condor reintroduction and uh, we'll have less human condor conflict. We'll release about 120 birds over the next 20 years. And we're hoping that Northern California is the next phase of recovery that's gonna lead birds throughout the Pacific Northwest and kind of start recovery there. The ultimate vision, of course, is birds without transmitters and tags, just out there doing their thing without us messing with them. Um, I do want to give a little shout out to the field crew. I already talked about how hard they were. Um, our first field crew that came on when we first started the program, they came on thinking they were going to be biological technicians. And we were like, here, prep this steel for welding and do this <laughs> helping us build the site and they did a fantastic job. We were super, super pleased with them and, and sad to have them go. But our next field crew is just as amazing. And they're operating the table back there, selling shirts and 
uh, doing outreach related to uh, lead and non-lead and kind of what goes on with all of that. And they can give you all kinds of great information. So if you go back to the table, um, just give them a big thank you for all the hard work that they do. And with that, let's see what birds actually look like when they fly. And people are welcome to ask me any questions. Um, in the pie graph that we have about condors, is 29% condors, what's the biggest sign? Could be, let's see, uh, coyotes, uh, bobcats have predated condors, mountain lions have predated condors. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with that number, when I talk about anthropogenic causes and I talk about the big impact that lead has, um, a lot of the cases of condors being killed by predators, striking power lines, other things, uh, after we started really noticing, wow, lead's a really big deal, and they started going back and looking at all those condors because they had been preserved, um, and they found that actually a lot of those birds had very high levels of lead also. So they were probably compromised by lead prior to being predated or colliding with things. And so we're probably seeing artificially high levels of mortality from other sources do also to lead toxicosis. You had two groups go out? Two groups, yes. So what's your total count over? Total count is eight birds right now. There are different release areas. Are there different statistics on survival rates in the different areas or anything dramatically different from the others? There's slightly different causes. I think mortalities are about the same, although mortalities have been pretty high in the Grand Canyon area, uh, but there's some, some artificial management things that have gone into that that probably skew those. So it's hard to really get a, a really solid idea on, on you know, that. Like the Grand Canyon in the beginning, if there was birds that were not doing well at other field sites, they would say, we'll try them over here. So they were taking all the problem birds. And so not too surprising that they had higher levels of mortality early on. So some of those, I got a couple other, one other video I'm gonna show you guys. So you guys saw a little bit of condor bathing a moment ago, and who can't do with seeing more condor bathing? <laughs> You didn't know they were water birds, did you? Chris, <laughs> um, we've got a couple questions online too. If I can pop one in. Um, Maya would like to know do the condors in the flight pen come from different breeding facilities so that there is genetic diversity? They do. Um, right now, the birds that we've received have been both from the Oregon Zoo and from the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise, Idaho. Um, those have been the only birds that we receive. And, and when it comes to deciding where birds are going to go, there's actually each condor that's in the breeding program is fully genetically mapped. So we know what genes are present in each bird. We know what genes to expect in offspring. And then they actually look at those offspring. And then they look at the full complement of genetics at the field sites. And they decide which bird has the complement of gen genetics, which is going to most benefit each individual field site. So all of the choices for where birds go is totally based on genetics. We're kind of just starting out, so we're not as important. So we get kind of like the least genetically specialized birds at this point in time. <laughs> and sort of to follow up, these guys, as you said, are youngish. So you don't even expect to see breeding for like four or five years, maybe. The, the oldest birds, A1 and A0, I think they're... Oh boy, do you know off the top of your head, Patrick, where we're at? Three and a half. So, uh, but you know, the other thing about new release sites, uh, we do know that at other sites, it's been seen that when it's a new site and there's no breeding going on, the birds kind of really don't know what to do. 
And so sometimes they won't kick into starting breeding action until maybe like eight years of age. Whereas if there's another site where they're watching other adults go through breeding, display to each other, copulate, they'll be like five and they'll be like, oh, let's try this. You know? so, <laughs> so that's when they kind of learn from kind of hanging out with other convoys. And we notice any interaction uh, with them in the wild with turkey vultures? So. Um, they really are mostly ignoring them. I mean, I've seen condors kind of grab turkey vultures and step on them if they get in their way at other times. I haven't seen that too much. Is it? Have, have any of you noticed them interact with turkey vultures? They pretty much almost act like they're just well, not they pick up on maybe a turkey vulture scene where there might be food that go down. They're really not, they're not going too far. They started doing some of those longer range uh, movements right towards the end of summer. And so the, the flying weather was still good, but they weren't really foraging yet. And then since, you know, the, the hammer came down pretty hard this winter early and um, they've been sitting really close to home and just coming in and, and eating the food that we put out for them. So we don't think they've actually eaten anything else yet. There was a... Um, there was a young bald eagle hanging out at the site that they tangled with a little bit um, because the, the bald eagle was coming in and feeding on the carcasses pretty frequently. Um, and I've seen a couple of the birds flying with a golden eagle, but it didn't seem like there was any kind of negative interaction. It was just staying a little bit above them, like it was just checking out, like, who are these guys? <laughs> Anything else online? Yeah. Um, Alicia would like to know is there an animal care manual in development? Animal care manual. That would be a question for the veterinary hospitals. I don't think so. I mean, I've been trying to find out a lot of information about that. Yeah. And really it's like hang out with the vets and get, you know, from them what their, their care practices are. Um, Karen would also like to know how did they do in the recent storms? They did really well. Um, it, they've got this little area that's kind of uh there's an old growth, second growth interface on this ridge line, and there's this little kind of pocket that, that extends down the ridge a little bit. So if you get down into that pocket, it's almost like you're surrounded by old growth, but they can still fly out over the second growth is what it seems to me what's going on. So it seems like they're kind of protected on all sides by old growth around them, and they're just hanging out in this one stand quite a bit. Uh, but... I was just, I've talked to some people at some other release sites about the fact that we've seen birds come in and land in sideways rain and feed and then leave in sideways rain still. Usually condors don't really like to fly in the rain. So we've got some serious Pacific Northwest condors going on. <laughs> they're just like, oh, this is just how it works. So it's, they're doing really, really well. Any other questions? What kind of animals do you keep the condors in? Where do you get those animals? I knew this would come up. <laughs> um, so we're mostly feeding dairy calves to condors. So um, we've actually uh, established a really great relationship with Alexander Dairy. They've been super excited about working with us on this project. And uh, we actually have chest freezers at operations down in Ferndale and up in Smith River. So when they get uh, stillborn calves, they just put them, in, put them, they bag them up and put them in the freezer for us, and they let us know when the freezers are full, and we go up and pick them up. And uh, there's, we're about to get some an influx of goats from a, a goat dairy around here, and we've also got just individual people that are kind of in the know with the local dairy uh, industry and whatnot that just call us out of the blue and they say, hey, we've got a goat that just passed or hey, we've got an animal that's about to go down. Do you need it? And so we've been getting a lot of, of stuff. Actually, we had the power go out at our facility in Oric and pg &E was projecting that it was gonna be out for several weeks. They got it on faster than that, but we were concerned about everything thawing. So we moved everything the whole contents of our walk-in freezer to another walk-in freezer in Klamath that someone gave us access to. And we were like, wow, we've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> and Pinnacles National Park is always kind of struggling to get enough food for their birds. So we actually ended up throwing 21, 22 carcasses into a pickup truck and driving them down meeting Pinnacles halfway to give them a bunch of carcasses because we had so many in reserve. 
So um, yeah, the the dairies, especially Alex and Dairy, have been just a huge partner for us. Given the the easy food and their social nature, what what will trigger them to spread out and get natural food? They just like to explore, especially when they're kind of in their juvenile phase. So I'm expecting next spring and summer that they're just going to explode across the landscape. Um, and why do they stop coming? I think it's when they get to the point that they're so familiar with what's out on the landscape that they realize they don't need to go and get it. And, and that's something I, I talked a lot with the, the folks down at the Grand Canyon area. And I remember them saying that they got to the point where they were just like, the birds find so much out there that why come back to this spot when they could just go anywhere? And they actually were getting um, pictures sent from people with game cameras on the ranches of birds that they didn't even realize were still alive because the transmitters had gone dead and they never saw the birds anymore. And then they realized, oh, they're actually just fine. They're just living somewhere else and never coming back to us anymore. <laughs> That'll happen. We're a long ways off from that. I mean, that, that site's been operating for probably 20 years so. I'm just going to interrupt for a minute. Um, it is eight o'clock, so I do want to let folks go that are ready to go. Um, I, but Chris can answer a couple more questions if you want to stay too. Um, I just wanted to let folks know we have their teachers from Rock back in the class. And this is a free lecture, so welcome everyone to come here under no obligation to Um, like the like this Conger reintroduction program. So I have a basket up front, and it's next to a stack of of um, a calendar with all the upcoming lectures on it for this series. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Chris. It was a fantastic lecture. We just learned so much, and really enjoyed having you today. No, there isn't. Um, so I got the report that, that 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 occurred, and I went up there and actually met with the uh, the investigator that was investigating the poaching, and he did his examination and then left. And so I babysat the elk for the rest of the day. And because I didn't, I was the only one working that day. So I just sat with the elk to make sure the birds didn't come down. The next morning, we went up there with our portable x ray equipment and we x rayed the elk. Uh, we found lead in one portion of one of the elk. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the meat had been taken. Uh, one had been shot in the head, we did the head. The other one, um, there, was, uh, there was lead through the neck area. So we were actually doing a release of a bird that day too. So once we figured out exactly where it was, I took off to go and facilitate the release and I left the, the parks biologists there and they went ahead and removed that whole section of neck and, and took it out so that we didn't leave any lead painted carcass in the field. What do they smell like? <laughs> Just talking about this earlier. It's, it's, a, it's a tough smell to describe. Um, it, 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 it's kind of sickly, but it's kind of sweet as well. I've, I've talked to people and they say, do you think do you find them sweet smelling? And it's like, yeah, but it's not a good sweet. But, um, and you, you really kind of get, get honed in on it when you're in a car with them for like eight hours, especially, especially if you have like four or five of them in the car with you. Is it also illegal to be lead shot in Oregon? It is not illegal to use lead shot in Oregon. How can that be um, there is well, there's a, there's a really big program going on through the Oregon Zoo. Uh, they actually have a lead outreach biologist at the zoo who is working with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they do a lot of lead outreach events. And so we work with them sometimes as well. And um, they've made a lot of progress in Oregon. I mean, it went from you know, an issue that no one had heard about, you know, probably five or so years ago to uh, a really, I mean, everyone, all the hunters in Oregon know about it now. It's not required, but they're slowly getting people to shift up there voluntarily. Are they flying at similar altitudes to like the eagles and the vultures? 
I would imagine so. We haven't done any analyses of that yet. Um, I mean, I know that condors have been have been seen to fly at 15,000 feet. I don't think they're doing that here necessarily yet. They don't have to get that high for most of the landscape that they're covering. Once they start, you know, going longer distances, I mean, I'm envisioning a day when they'll be foraging over Mount Lassen and when they're covering longer distances like that, they'll go up to those high altitudes and then just, you know, beeline in a certain direction. And they'll get really high and they can go, they can go over 50 miles an hour to straight line flight once they get up that high. Uh, I'm just curious, like with the growing threat of wildfires, maybe not the rains, rains, but do you imagine that has an impact on the population? It certainly can. Uh, there was fires just a couple of years ago that that impacted the Big Sur site and uh, took out, I think it was eight or nine birds in one fire. So they de it definitely can have an impact. That fire just happened to sweep up a ridge where there was a, a communal roost and there was a lot of birds there. And it happened at night when they can't really fly. Um, the nice thing about where our release area is, is it's parks managed land. So they actually burn that area. You know, they have controlled burns there. So they're gonna be burning through the area where our facility is. And we'll just make sure there aren't birds in the pen right when they do their burn. And so there's not a lot of fuel buildup right around there. So for, especially for our young naive birds, that's, that's super convenient. You know, but we're not gonna have birds that can't fly can't get away from a fire situation. Yeah. Is there any speculation about um, like the monitoring procedures affecting their parents? There's not. Um, there's been debates, but uh, but nothing so far. Uh, I kind of wondered for a while. And there was some debate within the program about wing tag color because some birds, you know, cue in on colors and. Uh, it's been shown that some birds that have color bands on their legs are more or less successful at mating than other, that, you know, ones that have different color combinations. And so we kind of had that debate within the program, and some people said, oh, that could be an issue. Other people said, no, that's not an issue at all. So <laughs> I had no idea. So when I decided what to do, I said, well, let's just do often American black tags and just not introduce color into the, the situation. So others like to use color still. And... Uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly nothing definitive out there yet on it. Yeah? Um, nesting, when they start nesting, what are they like? What are they doing? They are cavity nesters. So um, down in Southern California, where a lot of the observations happened early on or and before the program even started, they were using pothole nests in cliff faces and things like that. There was one known giant sequoia nest down during that period of time. In Big Sur, we were, you know, I started working in Big Sur in 99 and, you know, we were always kind of trying to figure out where are the birds going to go? Where are they going to go? Where's the first nest going to be? But they see stuff out there that we have no idea about from the ground. And so the first nest in Big Sur was a quarter mile from the release site. We had no idea there was a redwood cavity right there. The next nest was in the next canyon over. The next nest was in the next canyon the other direction. So they were just setting up territories within canyons and they were finding ample cavities to nest in in the redwoods in Big Sur. And as Joe Burnett down there likes to say, our redwoods are like babies compared to yours. So we got to have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of nest cavities available in the trees up here. And I've, I've talked to some of the, the redwood um, canopy biologists around here and kind of gotten numbers on what we could expect. And certainly the old growth is not what it used to be in our area, but there's a lot of cavities in the trees that are out there. So um, we think that they'll be okay. But do they tend to go back to the same original nest or do they chop around for the next time? They'll chop around a little bit. They'll kind of establish a territory and they'll nest in it. And if, if they like the territory and they get comfortable there, they'll kind of look the next year or the next two years later when they go to nest again, um, they'll they'll look around at different cavities and they'll kind of inspect a lot of different ones and then they'll settle on one. So usually it seems like if they can, they'll get three or four different cavities that they can nest in within their area. And then they'll kind of bounce around. They'll go back to old ones again and kind of, you know, rotate through them. How are avian levels being monitored right now in wild populations? 
not super well, unfortunately. Um, and, and we've been talking with some of the state biologists about it, and um, they're just, they're really up against the wall as far as funding. They're trying to divert funding from other projects to try and do a better job at monitoring. But um, there's no one out there making a concerted effort to kind of randomly collect or anything like that. It's just whatever gets sent in. So I know some people work for natural resource agencies out there. So they can always, um, you know, send in any, any birds that they find. If you find dead birds, um, the more data we have, the better. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it hits everyone's pocketbook when you're out there trying to do your job on the landscape. And you're like, okay, now I got to get this bird, send it in to someone and go through all the protocols. Um, but it's definitely appreciated that people can do that for sure. We had an online question from Gretchen, and she wanted to know what are the current volunteer needs for the program. Is <laughs> <laughs> expression? Yes. <laughs> we always love to have Gretchen. Um, uh, there's, you know, it's at this time of year. There's, well, it depends what we're doing. You know, some uh, with those last storms, we had a lot of just. Go put a chainsaw and clear the road yet again. Um, but during the summertime, especially this coming summer, you know, because we're so new, we don't really know what's going to happen year to year as we're starting out and, and, and we're kind of getting rolling on this. I expect, like I said, that the birds are going to really spread out next year. At that point, it's going to be okay, we've got a field crew to manage the birds that are here, but then how many people do we need to send out to track the birds that are that are 100 miles away? And we just haven't gotten into that yet. So we're just trying to keep our head above water and can keep checking things. But I would imagine come next summer, we'll probably definitely have some needs. Oh, good. Um, Olivia's wondering if the birds trackers have been seen overlapping at all after they were released. So are the condors having overlapping home ranges, basically? They're all hanging out together as a flock right now. So, and not obviously not, not interacting with any of the other release sites because they're super far away from those. So, um, like, especially when the storm comes, and I mentioned that stand of trees that seems to be somewhat protected. Like, I have a feeling they're probably all in the same tree or maybe two or three trees just hanging out, like, oh, it's storming. Like, it's like you're, you're, you're homebound playing board games with the family. They're all just hanging out doing condor stuff together in the trees. Uh, Monica would like to know, can you talk some about parthenogenesis for asexual reproduction in condors? Is that really a thing? <laughs> I am not the expert on that. Um, that is, that's all right. There, they, there has been parthenogenesis uh, observed. So um, a female without breeding, laying an egg that became fertile and, and hatched. Um, those, those birds have not gone on to thrive. And uh, we did actually, my first cohort of birds I released in Big Sur, um, we had one of those parthenogenesis birds uh, in our cohort. And she was, um, she was smaller than the rest of the birds. She was a pretty little bird, um, always looked pristine, but she just did not socialize well, uh, had a really hard time kind of interacting with the other birds. And, um, we did finally release her, and she was uh, she was found wing begging to a horse the next day. So she had a lot of behavioral issues. We don't know if it was related to that. Uh, she ended up, I think they tried her at another release site and it didn't work out very well. So her behavior was definitely off. Um, and then she died of some kind of rare genetic disease at, at only like five or six years of age. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it is 18, so we're gonna. We, I know we still have, oh, we have to have there been any sightings by members of the public yet. There have been sightings from members of the public, um, and for a long time, there was a lot of sightings that were kind of very far and obscure that we didn't necessarily believe. But now we're starting to get some, like we had one at Lax Creek, and we know the birds were down at Lax Creek, um, and people have seen them up around like Bald Hills Road. Um, they do soar over Bald Hills Road quite frequently. So I think that's probably the, the area that we've had the most sighting. So if anyone wants to see them, probably Bald Hills area is the best place to go. There's actually a road there that you can access. Well, thank you again. Thanks to all of the rest of the Condor team in the back, too. <laughs>